So the next section of the textbook is about solubility. And so the phrase solubility just means how much solute can I dissolve inside of a given amount of solvent? And so the units of solubility actually match the definition precisely, which makes it kind of handy because you, um, once you see, once you see the units, you know what it means, right? So like, for example, um, it, 36 grams of NaCl can dissolve into 100 grams of water. That's a solubility. That's the saturation level. So if I put 37 grams in, that would be a saturated solution, right? Okay, so in our lecture section, we are gonna go over this FET simulation, and we're gonna answer some of these questions. You might wanna think about them ahead of time based on your reading in the textbook. All right, so let's go back to my example of the NACL. This is what it would look like if I put a whole bunch, way more than 36 grams of NACL into 100 milliliters of water. Remember, 100 milliliters is not a super huge amount, right? It's, you know, your little beaker, like about this tall. And 36 grams of NACL is actually quite a lot. It's quite a big palmful, okay? Um, so that means that salt has a high solubility, which we would predict because ion dipole interactions are really strong, and that's what's holding the salt in the water. Um, so you can think about solubility also as a percentage. I just said it was 36 grams out of 100. So that's exactly the same thing as saying it's 36% soluble, right? Um, that's a handy thing to know. If I put 60 grams of NaCl into my 100 milliliters of water, we then understand that that means some of it is going to be a solid. It will not dissolve. That's this part, all right? So we call this, when you have a solid in the bottom, we call this a saturated solution. It means it's full. You can't fit any more. If I dumped more NaCl into here, what would happen? We would get more solid, right? No more aqueous, just solid NaCl. Um, so in this case, if I have 100 grams of water, and I know I can normally fit 36 grams of NaCl in there, but I put 60. It's pretty simple to figure out how much I have at the bottom. Your excess is just going to be those two numbers subtracted. Okay, so that means I have 24 grams of solid sitting on the bottom of this beaker, and I have 36 grams of NaCl that are dissolved in the water. Okay, so this is a really neat video that we're gonna watch. You can actually create a super saturated solution, which means we have put in more into the aqueous phase than it should have fit. So for example, if I wanted to make a super saturated solution of NaCl, what I would do is take the water and boil it, okay? And then I would dissolve as much NaCl as I, as I can at the high temperature. Let's think about the IMF. How would boiling the water influence the IMF that might occur between the solid and the water? Okay, so we have more energy in there since we've boiled it. Why would we be able to dissolve more solid? Write your answer down and we're gonna talk about that in our next synchronous session. Um, I'm also gonna link this video to in the next section and you can take a look at it. It's really cool. This is something called polyacrylamide, uh, no. No, it's not, I changed the video. This is sodium acetate, which is pretty cool. You can use it to make hand warmers. Let me show you why. So what we have here is a marble. You don't have to go look at the link. I'm just gonna walk you through it. Um, so, What we have is a marble platform. We have these in our lab where the, um, the uh, analytical balances are because they're very, very sensitive to vibration. And you're gonna see in a second why this is on a marble slab. Marble reduces vibration, by the way. So what he's gonna do, and it, so what they did is they took this flask and put you know, water in it and boiled it. And then they added as much sodium acetate as they could 
while it was boiling. And then you let it sit on this marble and cool down really, really, really slowly without any bumping or vibration. And then they're gonna bump it here in a second. You're gonna see the ripples on the surface. There we go. And as soon as they bump it, you start to see these solid crystals growing really rapidly. This is not a time lapse. This is real um, time. If you touch this flask right now, you would get burnt. It's really, really hot. So it's crystallizing very, very quickly, forming those really strong intermolecular forces. And that is releasing a lot of energy. It's an exothermic process. So if you touch it, it's hot. Hence the hand warmer thing, right? Um, Okay, so you don't need to go watch the video. I just showed it to you and explained what was happening. All right, so hand warmers are made this way. Ice packs are made the same way, but you have to pick an endothermic reaction. Okay, so when you snap an ice pack, what you're doing is breaking a little teeny vial of liquid in there, probably water. And when it mixes with the solid part of the ice pack, it's endothermic, so it absorbs heat from your wound, your you know, your bruise or whatever. Okay. So I want you to, I want you to think about what can we do that will increase solubility of a solute. All right. So let's assume it's the same solute. Clearly, if you had stronger IMF, that would make the solubility higher. But I'm talking about if we have, say, sodium chloride, and I want to make it more soluble, what can I do? I also would like you to jot down the units of solubility, paying close attention to whether you're talking about the solute or the solvent. All right, so just based on molecular structure, we can actually determine whether something is going to dissolve in water or not. All right, that's based on the intermolecular forces. If something has um, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding or ion dipole, it will mix with water very well. But if something has predominantly um, London dispersion forces, something is nonpolar, then it's not going to mix with water all that well. So we have a series of alcohols. Alcohol is a hydrogen bond uh, capable part of this molecule, and it's in competition with the hydrocarbon part of the molecule. All right. And so as we kind of go up in the number of carbons, what do we notice about the solubility? And then in contrast, when we're thinking about the solubility in ben, what is that? That's hexane, not benzene, it's hexane. Um, hexane is a hydrocarbon, and so it has only LDF forces. And so in order to get to things to dissolve in it, you have to have a lot of LDF, right? So we notice that methanol must not have that much in the way of LDF because you can only dissolve a very small amount of methanol into hexane, okay? But that's okay, because you can dissolve methanol in water all day long. This is the infinity sign, meaning you can mix it in infinite proportions. All right. So down here, make a quick note. As we increase the number of carbons, what happens to solubility in water? How come? Vitamins. Okay. So um, vitamins are a really interesting thing. Despite the fact that most Americans are not malnourished, we often don't get the nutrients we need from our diets. So that means we're not eating enough fruits and veggies, guys. Um, so one thing you might do to fix that is to take a multivitamin, right? And if you read the multivitamin labels, they'll often have like 100% of a variety of different vitamins in them. Now, this confuses me as a chemist because I know that different vitamins have different structures, which means they have different polarity. All right, so just as two examples, vitamin A, which is super important for your vision, uh, the way your, your vision works is like uh, the molecule that makes up vitamin A flips its shape, and that's how you perceive light. Um, so if you don't have vitamin A, it's, you can't perceive light, which means you don't see. Uh, so very, very important to get it. Uh, vitamin C, also really important. We actually don't really know what vitamin C does. Uh, a lot of people think it helps prevent like flus and viruses and there's actually no evidence that that is true but there is a lot of evidence um, for other helpful things it's an antioxidant so is vitamin a which means it will help you prevent aging related issues it will help prevent cancer stuff like that but um vitamin c is kind of a mystery we know that people get sick if they don't have it but we don't really know why 
So anyway, vitamin C is this kind of cyclical structure. It has a circle. Well, it's technically a pentagon, but anyway, we call them cycles. Um, it's got this cyclical structure, and then it has all of these OH bonds, these, these alcohol groups hanging off of it. That means vitamin C is very polar, especially when you think about the difference between these two, right? Vitamin A has a lot more carbons and they're very spread out. So that means a lot of London dispersion forces and only one hydrogen bonding site. Whereas vitamin C is very polar. It's got a lot of OHs on the outside and those carbons are kind of shielded, okay? So when you think about whether vitamin A dissolves in water or doesn't, you have to be thinking about the shape of the molecule. Um, same thing for vitamin C. Which one of these two do you think is going to dissolve in water? I hope you got it. The other one is going to dissolve in lipids better. We usually call lipids oil or fat, right? So um, have you ever wondered why people put salad dressing on their salad? Well, maybe you haven't, but I have. The reason is that a lot of those vitamins from colorful vegetables like carrots um, and tomatoes and so forth, a lot of those are really, really big carbon chains. Vitamin A, beta carotene, lycopene, all of those things, really, really big carbon chains. In order to get those nutrients into our cells, you need to have a lipid present when you eat it. So if you don't have any dressing, if you don't have any milk or butter or gravy or something fatty with your salad, you're not absorbing those vitamins. Um, Vitamin C is the opposite though. If I wanna get vitamin C absorbed, I wanna take it with a lot of water and not so much oil, right? Um, actually, as it turns out, vitamin C helps iron absorb too, which is really interesting. They're cofactors. We don't know how that works, but it's interesting. So at any rate, it doesn't make sense really to take a multivitamin. I mean, I do anyway, but when you think about it, some of those are hydrophobic, meaning afraid of water, like vitamin A. And some of those are hydrophilic, meaning loves water, like vitamin C, but you're taking them all at one time. Huh. That's the importance of essentially IMF, all right? It tells us when things will dissolve and in what they will dissolve in. And as it turns out, we're gonna use this in lab a lot, okay? Um, when you do chapter nine, you're gonna see that when you add chloride in the form of HCl to silver, mercury, and lead, it forms a solid. You're gonna see it as kind of a milky cloudiness at first, but then you're gonna centrifuge it and it'll settle down to the bottom and you'll see that it's a solid. That's because um, essentially AgCl, PbCl2, and HgCl2 are not soluble in water. So you're using the lack of a dipole to um, isolate those ions by reacting them with chlorine. Now, if we chose a different ion, say nitrate, uh, which is very polar, it won't precipitate. If you put nitric acid in there, you're not gonna get a solid because there's, there's too many intermolecular forces between Ag and O3 and water. So it stays aqueous, okay? Um, so the whole point of the qual scheme in lab is to control when things precipitate and how they precipitate. And that is by essentially controlling the intermolecular forces. This is a review from 141. This is one way to think about solubility rules, but you can look up solubility rules in your um, index in your textbook and review this if you're not familiar. Um, so the important part for group one of our lab is that Silver, mercury, and lead. And by the way, mercury is super cool. We all know that it's toxic in its element form, but when it's an ion, it's actually diatomic. It's the only diatomic um, ion that I know of. We have heard of diatomic gases and um, diatomic elements like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, iodine, all of those. But an ion that's diatomic, that's pretty cool. As far as I know, nobody knows why, but I think it's fun. This makes it a little confusing to write your reactions in the chapter nine book, but it does explain it if you read it really carefully. So, so be careful. At any rate, when, when we mix anything from group one, we call it the silver group, um, with any halogen. 
so chlorine, bromine, iodine, except for fluoride, then it will precipitate. So insoluble, because when we mix these together, you get a solid. There's not enough IMF to keep it dissolved. But if I mix, say, silver with nitrates or acetates, it will still be dissolved. Okay. So this is just a quick summary. If you have a different way of remembering the solubility rules, it's, it's very, very handy when you're writing your reactions in labs. So you might want to review those.